Hello, everyone. Welcome back um, to the Green Chemistry Connections webinar. We're thrilled to have you join us. Today's discussion is a follow-up from last week, last week's webinar, John Warner's Earth Day webinar. We had a, a really wonderful um, response, so we're so glad that so many of you could join us last week and um, for all of you that can continue on the conversation this week. We received so many questions that we just couldn't get to them all. So we wanted to schedule another time to um, really discuss some of these questions and, and have the time to talk through them with John. So that's what we're going to be doing today. So my name is Amy Cannon, and again, I'll be your host um, in this question and answer time with John. I'm the executive director and co-founder of Beyond Benign, a nonprofit dedicated to green chemistry education. And this webinar is being brought to you by Beyond Benign, where our mission is to foster a green chemistry education community that empowers educators to transform chemistry education from cradle to career for a sustainable future. So thank you so much for joining us again today. If you were able to tune in last week, um, and uh, you know, we thank you again for rejoining us. Um, if you'd like to stay uh, involved and continue to stay engaged with us, please do sign up for our newsletter on the bottom right of our homepage on beyondbenign.org, and you'll be notified about any upcoming opportunities and webinars as well. And again, if you like what you hear today and would like to contribute, then please do so by using our donate link on our homepage. As always, before we begin, um, we'd like to review some logistics briefly. So we're broadcasting live and recording the session. Um, so all attendees are in listen-only mode and all lines are muted. If you have a question, um, we are going to be reviewing questions today, but if you do have a question that arises as we're going through this discussion, then please type it into your question chat box on your control panel. Um, we have two wonderful moderators here, Natalie O'Neill and Janie Butler, who are going to be curating and managing our questions. Um, so that you know we can take additional questions. We'll, we'll see what we've got time for today. Um, the recording will also be posted on the link that you see in the in the welcome box, but also on this PowerPoint slide. So you can see um, the recording from last week's webinar found on that archive page, as well as we'll post this question and answer uh, webinar. For those of you who participate in social media, please do connect with us on Twitter or Facebook. And um, also just let us know where you're joining from. We'd love to know. We know last week we had a good number of people, fo uh, folks joining us from all over the world. Um, and as mentioned last week, we, our, our fabulous Juliana Vidal is joining us all the way from Brazil to help with this conversation. Um, so please do reach out to her and uh, feel free to tweet questions, type them in the chat box, whatever you like. Um, but please do reach out and connect with us. And thank you so much for being part of this community. Okay, so um, before we begin our question and answer period session here today, we wanted to just get a good idea of who's on the line with us um, today. So I'm gonna ask Natalie O'Neill to um, launch a poll so that you can tell us about yourself and we can get a good gauge of of who's joining us today. So that should come up and great. So please feel, free. you should be able to select one or more if you don't fall into one category alone. So you know. Okay, the votes are coming in and we can see. Okay, and there we have it. Okay, so, whoops. <laughs> we are, we launched the wrong poll, it looks like. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Here we go. There's the one. Tell us about your background. <laughs> now you should be able to uh, select one or more of the following. Sorry about that. We are, we are, um, 
we, we've upgraded our, our subscription here because of the overwhelming response for our webinars. So we're, we're learning new things with these polls. So thank you so much for learning with us and being our, our guinea pigs in this. Okay, now here's the poll. <laughs> Okay, great. So it looks like we have um, a good number of, of higher ed folks. Um, we have actually folks from across the uh, across the uh, the spectrum here. So that's a just to give you a good sense, John, of who we're talking to today too. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for joining us. Um, okay, with that, um, again, we are sorry, we are. Um, happy to answer questions for you today. So again, as, as we're talking today, um, feel free to type them in at any point. So with that, we're gonna go into some of these questions here. Um, my first question, John, where are you? I know that you're, <laughs> I know that you're in the house, but uh, it looks like you're in some sort of uh, laboratory. Can you, can you tell us where, where you Edison. are? This is Thomas Edison's lab in Orange, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. I love it. And this, these are all the fancy things we can do now with all of our virtual meetings and, and during this age of um, Zoom and online meetings. So wonderful. Okay, so I'm going to start off kind of with some big picture questions. Um, and, and, and we'll move through kind of shifting topics here. But some of the big um big questions you know what are your ideas about how the world is moving forward and achieving the goal of making the planet sustainable and sort of to build on that you know what are some exciting things that you see happening john and and where are there opportunities mm -hmm. cool well well thank you it's um very very flattered to be um asked to answer questions obviously um I, I want to give my disclaimer that again I don't claim to have any gifted insight here and you know I'm happy to share my opinions and my thoughts that I've gathered through my experience in life but I have no presumption that I have any gifted insight or any 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 better view of this than anyone else on this line and you know for us to you know truly be a sustainable society we need to to share everybody's opinions and so here I am vulnerably out here you know you know telling you the way I think of things but I think everyone else's opinion is just as valid and just as important. So I, mean, I, I put myself out there for criticism and for acceptance and whatever, but we all need to be sharing our thoughts, not just me. Um, there are so many reasons to be optimistic. I think that we're in a we're in a world right now where pessimism sells. That you know we you. you you know, I, I, I use the, the concept, can you imagine if Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King got up and said, I have a nightmare. I would argue that the, the advances would have been much less um, because people are not motivated by fear. People are not motivated in the way that we need them to be by um, bad things you know and although we've got to be realistic and we've got to understand the real world as it is there has to be hope there has to be a path forward but that that hope and path forward has to be grounded in pragmatism at the same time and when you look around the world at the universities that are embracing green chemistry you look at the companies that have green chemistry programs you look at the ngos that are interacting in between governments and companies you look at the things happening in the European Union and Australia and United States as far as governmental policies and programs. It's slow and it takes up, but but there's so many reasons, you know, if, if you want to look at the, the cup is half half full, there's there's so many initiatives everywhere. Now, this, you know, the the world is designed to to sustain itself think of that word sustainability sustain means stay the way things are okay and so we can kind of get a 
challenge ourselves with that whole concept of sustainability. Life is about changing. Life is about evolution. So sustainability in, in and of itself is, is pragmatic. But it's a good thing because we don't want to be going off in all different directions. And so when we look at education, when we look at industry, when we look at government, we look at the, the NGO community, things are changing at a measured pace. And we don't want to be overly pushy because the reason we're in the situation we're in now is because we didn't think through things as well as we could. So saying, this is the solution, let's go do it, and doing it really, really quick is not going to get us where we need to be as, as well. So this measured patient getting as many voices as possible into the discussion is the only true path forward. That's great. And, um, you know, sort of building on that too, I mean, is there, this is a question from last week, is there a list of problems worth, worth problems worth solving, quote unquote, um, along with the value of solving them that this is specifically asked that Beyond the Nine considers import, important, but I would say that that you or you think the field should take note of in level yeah. of importance. I think it's, um... Jerry Garcia of the Grateful Dead, I think I once heard Paul Anasta say that this was a quote of Jerry Garcia. Um, this, you know, people say, oh, we should be the best that we should be. We should find what, you know, and, and just always push to be the best we should be. But Jerry Garcia apparently had a different view, and it was that we should find out what we're uniquely capable of doing that other people can't do and won't do if we don't do it and try to identify that. So from that perspective, the diversity of what we want to do, what's important to us as individuals is, you know, if we've got enough people, if we've got enough eyes, if we've got enough ideas on this process, you know, we, we can imagine that everyone's going to be covering different aspects of it. And so we need to be mapping it out. We need to be looking what everyone is doing. And interestingly enough, what we need to find out is one once we see what everyone is passionately wanting to do, see, are there gaps? Are there missing elements? And to make sure that we're filling them up. But again, I feel that, you know, obviously toxics in the environment is, is hugely important. Global climate change is massively important. And uh, environment, you know, plastics and non-degradables um, in the environment is massively important. You know, and so from, from, from these perspectives, everything is important and someone who has a unique skill to work on climate change should work on climate change not work on toxics because i think toxics are more important and so we we need to match people's skills and their desires with the needs and man do we have a lot of needs and problems out there but we also have a whole bunch of skills and abilities too and so what we need to do is is yes it's good to hear these prioritized lists but the most important priority is what the individual wants to do, what each individual person says, you know, I really care about this and I am going to spend my time doing this. And very rarely is that going to be an inappropriate thing to do. All right. That's great. That's a great point. Um, since we're since we're on this, this sort of big, bigger picture, I'm going to take one question that just came came in. Um, and this is this is from Avtar out in, in York, England. Um, so thank you for joining us, um, John. Great webinar last week with green chemistry. Now, 25 years on, 25 years old. What's your revised definition of green chemistry now that we have um, sustainable chemistry bringing in its own flavor? So that's well, I guess of, I, yeah, yeah I, I I wouldn't. You know, and, and I, I'm not I'm not approaching it from an egotistical perspective. I'm not saying that green chemistry is perfectly defined. It does work. But the, the thing is, is that as you know, when we first started the field of physics, if we did that, obviously the field of physics can continue to evolve, but physics is still physics. The field of biology is biology, the field of chemistry is chemistry, green chemistry, that while there are other nuances and aspects that come in to create a greater collaboration and a greater community. What we need to resist is going back and redefining the field. You know, there are people who have written textbooks. Right now, there are over 20 
um, conferences that are happening constantly under the umbrella of green chemistry. There are over 50 textbooks that, uh, that have been written using the, the current definition of green chemistry. And while there are other problems and things that get measured in, what we can't do is tear down that. You know, there are universities now that have green chemistry programs. We don't want to suggest that this field continues to re-evolve and change at some fundamental level that basis of we need to you know to design materials and processes that reduce or eliminate the use of generation of hazardous materials kind of works now when we add sustainability what we're really doing is saying, well what do we really mean by hazardous when we talk about circular economy how do we achieve these goals and so i don't feel that this is a definitional semantic thing I think it's trying to understand how it all fits together. And so I, I feel very strongly that when we spiral into definitional things, frankly, the world needs us to actually do stuff, not focus on definitions and semantics so much. And so, yes, it's great to characterize and, and to look at how we can work together and do these things, but let's put it in perspective. You know, we, there's a lot we need to do. So. Again, I, I'm comfortable with the definition of green chemistry as it is, and I hope the webinar last week showed how green chemistry fits into with the circular economy, with sustainability, with biomimicry, and that it's not a definitional issue as much as it is how does it fit together. That's great, and I think, um, yeah, it seems like uh, Avtar was trying to get it, as he mentioned, you know, the, the sort of um he agrees with the the you know the definition of green chemistry and that we can't tear down 25 years of, of, of this work um but i think it's that that um you know convincing of, of policymakers and this discussion that's happening in the policy world with sustainable mm -hmm. chemistry yeah and, and again just the, the 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 pushback that society is going to give goes back to the word sustainable Okay, and again, it's an important world. We, I would, I would actually argue, are we using the right word when we say sustainable? Because that is maintaining the status quo. It is government policies. There is an inherent nature to try to define what we are doing today as fitting some new program so we don't have to allocate new budgets. We don't have to allocate new programs. And so in a way, that there is always going to be a pushback. How can we redefine green chemistry to meet exactly what we were doing yesterday so we don't need to change things? How can we sustain what we were doing yesterday? So there's this dichotomy, there's this tension that we have to acknowledge here that we need change. We need change in how we do chemistry, how we teach chemistry, how we invent chemistry, and how we manage chemistry. And so ironically, we need to change so we can sustain. So, so yes. Yeah. That's great. I am going to jump a little bit, but I think we're going to come back to some of these points. Um, and I'm just going to share my screen for this, for this uh, question too. So this is one, you know, we received a few questions on this point that you may, that you make often on cost. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm pulling up your slide for reference from again, last week's discussion. I'll, I think I'll just put it on this one. Um, and I'm also guilty of actually stealing this slide because I think do, I do think this is uh, for some of my presentations because I think this is such an important point. But when you talk about cost being paramount to have a true green chemistry process, is it price or environmental cost? Because I could understand spending more money for something that has less impact on nature. Mm -hmm. So I wanted you to talk a little bit about this this cost okay. point. So the and I, I don't want you to call up the slide, but there was a slide that I showed before uh, last week in which I had behavior in one direction and I had technology in another direction. For us to move to the future that we want, we need changes in both behavior and in technology. And the more help we can give behavior with technology, the better. The more help we can give technology by changing behavior, the better. And so I just see as a, as a default assumption that as we invent new technologies, the more appropriate the cost is, the easier it is to be adopted. The more difficult 
the cost is, the more expensive it is. We run into problems first with, will people use it? Will people vote it? If we mandate it through regulatory processes in a hypothetical case where uh, the president of the United States changes and reevaluates environmental policy, that all comes down like a house of cards. So true sustainability of maintaining such an approach to, to build a future that's positive. If the, if the cost, economic cost and the performance are at a high level, we won't be dependent on other constructs on society. Now that's not saying we don't need those constructs that we scientists will not be able to and we can't snap our fingers and do this tomorrow. The field of chemistry has been around for 250 years or more depending on you know how, how you look at it. And so green chemistry has just been around for a couple decades. So for us to expect that overnight we're going to make things that are cost effective, high performance, you know, and oh, by the way, better for human health and the environment, no way. And so we will have some technologies that are a little bit too expensive and will need some behavioral modification changes from either government policies, incentives, or, or, or other kinds of consumer pressures. We will need that for the rest of my life for certain, you know. But the, the idea is to, to look at the goal, the long-term goal is to have the technologies be sound, be good for human health and the environment, in its inherent way and not to be dependent on these other constructs to help them. Um, and like I said, this is job security for inventors around the world for decades to come, but to acknowledge that is the best way to go about it. However, in the interim, we will always be looking at the, the, thing, the other ways to, to, to help facilitate that. Now, when it comes to environmental cost, that is part of the whole definition, I would say, of impact on human health and the environment. And so cost, when I say cost, is the economic cost, but there is no way that I would, I would define something as green chemistry that had a, a problematic cost on the environment to human health. So I see that as built into the, the fundamental assumption that when we're looking at human health and the environment, those costs <laughs> supersede everything else. Yeah, that's great. And I, th I think you kind of touched upon this, this second question on cost. Um, you, you mentioned a couple things in, in your answer here, so you might have answered it, but you know, cost is going to be a big deciding, deciding factor in whether companies are going to adopt green chemistry. So how can they be convinced, um, or maybe it's some of those incentives that you mentioned, um, that it will be cost effective and worth it to invest in such technology? Well, again, it's at the end of the day, and and you know, the when I when, when I answer a question like this, I want to make sure that you understand. I wish the world was different. I wish that consumers that retailers, that manufacturers, that people just got it and did the right thing. I, but again, who among us is capable of defining exactly what that right thing is? But having said that, I, I'm also the pragmatist that that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen as fast as I want it to happen. And, and so from, from my perspective, we need to help drive it. And I and the the unanticipated the, the most important force, I think, is the consumer. I think that the consumer, if people aren't buying a product because it's problematic for a sustainability, human health, environment issue, and those sales go down, all of a sudden you will find alternative technologies that might be a little bit more expensive, a little bit more palatable. And so at the end of the day, one of the issues that we have is this thing called voice of customer. You know, you know, a lot of organizations, a lot of companies want to serve voice of customer. And the funny thing is, is that when it comes to sustainability, when it comes to green chemistry, there isn't as much of a voice of customer. It isn't that there isn't a desire of customer. It's the voice. And so I, I use as an example, you know, having several daughters and being a fan of Disney movies, I use the Little Mermaid as an example. When the Little Mermaid is on a boat gazing into the eyes of Prince Eric, Prince Eric is saying, I want her to say she loves me. Okay, 
but wait a minute, she clearly loves him, but she's not saying it, she's not articulating it. So the idiot is waiting until she actually articulates it. Well, when it comes to green chemistry, of course consumers want to have something that has minimized impact on human health. And of course they want things that are sustainable. The problem is, is they don't, we don't know how to articulate it well. And so voice of customer presupposes that that articulation is gonna happen. Now, the thing is, is this, there is the desire, but we're not mind readers. And so there becomes a, a gap in this process because of it. And then the second part, what can you say to me? Well, John, actually voice of customer doesn't drive everything. Many breakthrough innovations did not respond to voice of customer. They came from some other place. All right, and I like to use the Disney Mall movie Frozen for this one here. You've got um, Elsa. Elsa has this amazing power, but zap, she blinds her sister. Zap, she makes this freakish uh, snowman. She hasn't really figured out how to use this power. And I would argue we chemists haven't quite figured out how to use the power of chemistry to do green chemistry because universities are not training chemists to understand implications on human health and the environment. We have an inherent ability, but we haven't honed it, we haven't trained it, robbing us of true breakthrough technologies by most people because they haven't been given that training and refinement. So we don't have voice of customer, we don't have a, 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 as much of an ability for breakthrough technology as we want. This isn't a, a per, we shouldn't despair, this is an opportunity. So here are paths forward, the behavior working on voice of customer, and then the ability, the technology working on the ability to deliver breakthrough technologies. Back again to, uh, to uh, behavior and technology, they gotta go hand in hand. Yeah, and I think this next question, because this is sort of staying on this topic of industry, and in, in you were mentioning the breakthrough, sort of those transformational technologies. Um, I think this one speaks to that. You know, how do you reconcile the fact that a new technology brings its own set of issues, and at the end of the day, m might be just as resource intensive as the original tech technology? So again, it's like that that trade off. Either you know the benefits of drop and replacements versus transformational technologies and the challenges. You know. Well, again, it's, you know, there's, there's something buried into the, you know, the reality here. If someone says something is sustainable, but it's not. If someone says something is green chemistry, but it's not, you know, it, it, it's almost, you know, so, so to me, if it's sustainable, if it's green, it is. If the technology reveals itself to be no better than the incumbent technology, then it wasn't green. And so there's a, there's a, there's a, a circular um, definitional loop where we're, we're, we're stuck in there. But again, that comes to the skills of the individuals, the people that are designing the technology, that are inventing the technology. If they don't understand the, the principles of green chemistry, if they don't understand those things, there is a very good chance that they will think they're making something that is has some advance, but then at the end will say, oh, oh man, that, that really didn't have any advance. That's why we want people to learn green chemistry. That's why we want this to be a fundamental component for the what it means to be a chemist, to be a material scientist, that if this is part of who we are as a culture, then those kinds of problems, they won't be avoided completely. We are humans, we are fallible, we will screw up. But the more knowledge we have in our education, the better chances we have that we'll avoid those problems. But yeah, so so at the end of the day, that you know, we're as we're as good as we're trained to be, and we're and we're determined to do. Thank you for always bringing it back to education. <laughs> we're going to get to some of those questions a little bit later too. Um, one one more industry related question that just came in from our friends in India. Um, so hello, Nitesh. Um, so according to you, John, what are the top three barriers to adoption and implementation? Of green chemistry and industry and i know sometimes you don't like to think about barriers so maybe it's opportunities well no well um, I'll, I'll, i i will yeah. say the following invention invention and invention uh, i'm being kind of funny there but maybe to me not to you um but for me if I invent a new technology that has nothing to do with sustainability, that has nothing to do with green chemistry, it's just a new technology. 
nowhere in history did an incumbent technology lie down and say, take me, I'm yours. That the status quo has a magical way of pushing back. We were manufacturing vacuum tubes years after the transistor was invented. People were manufacturing horse and buggy carts after the automobile was in, invented. There is a process by which those things in society, whether natural or human built, have a way of clinging to, of sustaining. And so when we invent something, that invention, irregardless of performance with respect to sustainability, human health, and the environment is always going to have pushback. It's just a natural natural feedback loop that, that, that happens. Now, we in the, in the sustainability community, we in the green chemistry community, hope and dream and wish that if a technology has a sustainability bent to it, it will have an even better chance of competing with the incumbent technologies. And I would like to believe that at some amount, to, to some extent that is true, but that's where behavior comes in. We still need to motivate and, and, and get that behavioral um, um, perspective a little bit stronger from the consumers, from the retailers and from the manufacturers. And so the first barrier is essentially the traditional barrier that all new technologies face independent of sustainability. The second one comes back to education. Do the scientists have the ability, do the engineers, do the material scientists have the knowledge to invent that technology in the first place? And so first is the, the, the inherent pushback. The second is the actual capability. You know, I, um, I, I use as an example, I'm, you know, my, 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 my daughter Natalie is in the other room behaving herself very, very well during this, this, this um, webinar. So that's very good so far. Hopefully she doesn't hear me and come storming in the room right now. But she's seven years old and she speaks perfect English, better than me, uh, better than her mother. Um, <laughs> um, she can read, she can write. But right now, she doesn't really know what a noun is. She doesn't know what a verb is. She doesn't know sentence structure. She doesn't know things like the parts of speech. Now, pretty soon, she's going to start taking classes to learn these things. And you can say, well, why bother? She's already reading. She's already writing. She's already doing these things. But I would argue, for better or for worse, she's mimicking her parents and her environment, and she's getting by. But when she learns sentence structure, when she learns parts of speech, she'll internalize that knowledge. She'll operate at a much higher level, not just with how she communicates her thoughts to the outside world, but how she shapes her thoughts herself. So the transformation from before and after is gonna be kind of amazing. I would argue that we chemists, Kind of like my seven-year-old daughter speaking English. Of course, we wake up in the morning saying, I'd rather not die today. And so when I go in the lab, I'm going to make decisions to hopefully prevent that from happening. And companies, the really smart companies, found out a long time ago that if you kill your customer, that's very bad for sales. So they've learned to try to avoid that where possible. So I would argue the desire to make safe products that don't hurt the human health and the environment has been around since the beginning of time. It's just make common sense but like my daughter speaking english we chemists we need that sentence structure the sentence structure in the semantics of chemistry the a plus b goes to form c plus d the nouns the verbs of how do we do this at a level that achieves the goals of green chemistry and if we haven't had that training then we can't achieve that so the Second biggest barrier after the pushback of the status quo, the second biggest barrier is the raw ability of chemists to do it. This isn't just because you want to make something safe without the skill set that's been given to you. You can't. And then the third one, and I could go on and on, but you asked for three. The third one, in my opinion, is the way that we finance innovation. That right now, I would argue that we, you know, when we scientists, we look at rate limiting steps. And when you look at a multi-step process, you find that one step that is rate limiting. And if you're going to change something, you need to address that rate limiting step. And I would look at from what I call the intellectual ecology, 
the rate limiting step of our intellectual ecology is the financing of R&D and specifically the scale up. You know, the early stage, you know, small amounts of funding to show that something is possible. We've got a lot of ability to do that. Ironically, if you've already demonstrated something viable and you want to get millions of dollars to set up a factory, that's kind of easy to do. It's the going from the feasibility to the prototype that is the what people refer to as the valley of death of all technologies, sustainable or not. And so if we can re-examine that financing investment model and have that favor those technologies that are sustainable, green, and better for human health, the environment, the climate, and all of that, then we can truly make changes. And right now, I would argue education is evolving. I would argue that industry is evolving. Consumers are evolving. The slowest thing to evolve from my perception, and this is the investment models, that we're still using the, the same investment models we have in the past. And, and until that changes substantially to favor technologies that, that have better um, you know, implications for human health, the environment, uh, we're going to be still stuck. So that, I would say, is the third barrier. I hope that's useful. That's great. And I love that you started with invention, 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 because you're in the perfect lab for that over there in Edison's lab. If you joined late, that's where he is, Edison's lab, right down the street from uh, Seton Hall, I believe. Right, David? <laughs> um, Okay, so I'm going to shift a little bit over to sort of current topics um, today. Uh, we got a lot of questions on, you know, our current scenario that we're in with COVID-19. Um, you know, so I'm going to kind of start a little, and then they also relate to some of the sort of bigger picture um, mm -hmm. questions that we're going to get to too. So how do you see green chemistry playing a role with the changes we're experiencing during, during COVID? You know, it, it's really interesting to see that you know, some the impact and the reduction of transportation and daily life and that sort of thing where we're seeing some clearing of smog in some areas. You know, are there any other opportunities here during this time? You know, how can green chemistry play a role? Well, you know, it, it, it's, it's interesting, you know, obviously this is a, a global pandemic that has just horrible implications for so many humans. There's so many people that are suffering that are, are, are struggling in, in some ways. You know, we 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 feel bad about you know being locked at home, and there are people that are suffering far worse than you know being stuck watching TV and reading books. You know that the the, the suffering of of the human population is not to be underestimated, and, and um, so I. I, I stop by just saying, you know, I'm a very lucky person that I'm in a position where, you know, although I'd rather my world be slightly different, it's not so bad. You know, I've got some nice people to hang out with here. Um, but it gives us an opportunity to pause. Think of the field of chemistry of going in the lab and pouring beakers and flasks around the world right now today. University students, university researchers, industrial researchers, have had to stop. They're not in the lab. They're not doing chemistry. And in a way, from a green chemistry perspective, that's you know what it's all about. Is before you do something, think about it. what are the implications before I rush into the lab and I pour beakers and flasks to run an analytical experiment or run a peak and experiment or do some kind of a polymer synthesis or design a new product or put it so glue, bolt, weld, whatever I'm doing to, perform, to, to push materials into the economy. If I stop and I think of, what am I doing? How am I doing this? What are the implications? That's what we really need to do. And so in a way, what this epidemic has forced us is to not be wed to the elevator pitch. Think of the destruction of our society, the elevator pitch. If someone says, okay, I want to do something, I want funding to do something, and you only have two minutes to describe it. Well, the most important things don't bubble up to those two minutes. So no one has an opportunity to say, well, wait a minute, did you think of the toxicity? Did you think, oh, well, well, that would have taken me four minutes. Well, we only had two. 
oh my God, can you think of the implications this has? You know, rush, rush, Harry, Harry, get it on an Excel spreadsheet, give me a Gantt shot, do it two minutes, now I gotta work on something else. Now all of a sudden, we're forced to stop. We're forced to think. And maybe hopefully a lot of us are gonna like that because mm -hmm. thinking and imagining things before you do it is the key to not making the same mistakes that were made in the past. And so if there's a silver lining to this, this process of talking to one another before we're rushing out and doing it, maybe something can, can maybe, you know, to use a horrible word, maybe that's contagious, all right? But, but that I see as the higher level thing. When we drop it down to actual technologies, I think we do need to think about, you know, in a, in a way, you know, the first principle of green chemistry, you know, it's better to, to avoid the, the problem in the first place, prevention being a pound of, worth a pound of cure. That's why we're isolated. That's why we're doing all the things that we're doing is trying to prevent the propagation. And at the end of the day, that's what green chemistry is all about. So if we think of that bigger picture and reduce it to how do we look at surfaces and cleaners and products and now start thinking about this new layer of when we talk about protection of human health and the environment, there is this new, it's always been here. This is something that people have known. It's, this pandemic has brought it to the forefront, but the propagation of these type of, of viral or microbial things, this is something that's gonna happen. If you you know you listen to Bill Bill Gates, you know, this, this is something that's gonna happen more. And we need to be equipped as a research and science community to find out ways to stop the propagation that's gonna be the medical cures, that's gonna be the medical things to inoculate, to immunize and to cure. But we material scientists have a role to play to minimize the dependency on those technologies as well and to anticipate future issues. Yeah, and at the same time, I mean, do you do you see that with this time there's going to be challenges? Um, this this relates to another question that came in about, you know, as we come out of the COVID-19, out of this pandemic, um, there's going to be a great need to kickstart the global economy. So how do we stop mm -hmm. negative chemistry from being used in excuse as an excuse for rebuilding the global economy. And I feel like it's not just applicable during this time. This happens a lot, yeah. you know, when, when, how do we, how can we avoid that sort of justification yeah. of going back to sort of traditional chemistries as opposed to yeah. moving forward? I think that's a, that's, that's a really good point. You know, it, you know, I, and again, remember that, you know, I, I certainly don't know all the perspectives of the world this is doing. I've, I've looked at how a lot of, stores when you do go to a grocery store once a week hopefully keeping it to a minimum they're no longer allowing you to have reusable bags and they're insisting on single-use bags in the stores okay and so one you know i'm not going to argue with the wisdom of that right now it, it is what it is but that has set us back a little bit. Now, um, again, like I said, I, I suspect that the wisdom of these decisions are justified, but now we're gonna have to come back out of that again, and maybe we need to imagine, okay, so we've just added another criteria to a sustainable technology. So if we have a reusable package, how can we design, how can we invent, how can the invention community out there look at a reusable surface and make that reusable surface just as good as a single-use material so that the next time this happens we're not going back to single-use materials but have surface treatments that are antiviral intrinsically and things like that that's another technology um, hurdle that we need to be addressing again to stop the propagation of the viral short of the medical responses the material science responses yeah, that, so you answered the, the next question. I was going to bring up that sort of compromise and the, the, the single-use plastic challenge that's coming up. Um, it's for not only infection control, but food safety, um, mm -hmm. you know, and so <laughs> we had... Um, I had a visitor. Um, so yeah, it, you know, it's an interesting scenario, I think, and um, I think this is going to jump over a little bit over into some of these big sustainability challenge challenge areas like ocean plastics and things like that. 
um, you know, so there was a question on, you know, encouraging, it's, it's this question of, of plastic use and food safety and particular single use plastics. Um, you know, how, why can't we encourage industry to go back to using glass for food and beverage packaging? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and where's that compromise, but not just glass, I think it's other technologies. I, yeah. I, I would build on that. Mm -hmm. Well, again, it's, there is this, there was a time before petroleum where all materials were bio-based, okay? We made our cloth bags, we made all, all the materials, you know, you know, we've made this differentiation of the plastics economy versus the bio-based economy. And I, and I think that one thing we've got to recognize is that for the vastly foreseeable future, it's not an either or that we have a certain dependency that until innovations and creativity bring us other ways of doing things we're going to need a little bit of both and so so how do we it enters in some of the behavioral things how do we address these issues from a behavioral perspective so that we aren't dependent solely on single-use disposable items but that would require behavioral changes going back to things that we used to do before but they were heavy glass is heavy so the transport of glass requires energy now we're in, in, inducing you know problems with you know climate change and carbon utilization and whatnot and so these constraints are not I don't see them as being insurmountable barriers, but that is where innovation has to happen. And if we have a large community of people saying, well, gee, it's going back to glass. Glass is really heavy. We don't really want to do that. Well, then what do we do? There, it, I cannot believe there is not an answer. We just haven't figured it out yet. And then, so the thing is, is, what do we do until we figure out better technologies? We will be dependent on behavioral things to and so that's where the organizations, there are a lot of companies that are using materials that we may say, ah, oh, I wish that they weren't selling that product and I wish that they weren't using this material. But you know, until we've invented technologies that can replace those problematic technologies, we're kind of got to keep using them. And so then we want to have the companies that have really good internal policies, that have really good programs to make sure if they are using things that we wish there were better alternatives to, that they have the right you know, responsible care and all these other programs to, to make sure that they, when we do have something less than ideal on the market that's in commerce, that we, we're doing it responsibly. And so that's where we, we, we need to recognize those companies. Don't give them a free pass. Don't say, okay, sell the problematic technology for the rest of your life. No, we got to constantly be working on alternatives. But let's also recognize that invention takes time. It doesn't fit on a Gantt chart. We can't say next Tuesday at 2.30, we'll invent an alternative to this material. It's something we've got to add the community and the society work to do. So how do we get from point A to point B? Through education, what do we do in the meantime? Make sure that our policies are in place that when we are using problematic materials, we're doing the best we can with them. And so that's the that dichotomy. And so if we could invent a time machine and just fast forward 50 years, well, well then hopefully we're looking back saying, oh my God, this is, you know, thank God we've, we've invented all these technologies. But we got this path between point A and point B that's going to require a lot of different perspectives. Yeah, and I'm going to take a question that just came in because um, I feel like it's related to this conversation. At last seminar, you mentioned using a hermit crab strategy of not necessarily building something new, but taking something that already exists. And so what do we do with our old shell or the things we've already made? Right. And so if the old shells, um, if they have use again the highest level of sustainability is to keep something with the same composition and the same form so remember this the, the way that i separate things is to what does the thing look like what is the shape of the thing and what is the composition of the thing and as long as we can keep things in the same form and the same composition then the energy inputs 
for the most part, will be the best that they can be. And so looking at reuses of materials, you know, if you have a shoebox and you take that shoebox and you, instead of going and buying a special uh, decorated box to put photographs or knickknacks in, you use a shoebox. That is kind of like the hermit club. You took the hermit club out and you put a bunch of photographs in and things like that. Now, right now, companies making those boxes that have their products in it will be able to use it. So when it, and, and, and if we can design it that way, um, so, so in, a, in a way, the way I look at this is we oftentimes, this is in the most part, not 100%, but for the most part, what this, this question invokes is the concept of packaging and that we have this separation. There is the product and there's the package. And the package is designed to protect the product from the environment and also sometimes to protect the environment from the product. But we look at it as two separate things. The hermit crab is the squishy thing and the shell is the thing that it goes into. But interestingly enough, when the hermit crab gets too big, its package doesn't get thrown out. A new hermit crab comes in and uses it. So I would argue that the package is just as valuable to the society of hermit crabs as the hermit crabs are. That the package isn't seen as a thrown away, but has in and of itself intrinsic value. And if we can look at our products and say, man, <laughs> I would buy this product just because of the package. And I wanna use that package. Right now that's laughable for most of the products that we get, the packaging is just, what are we going to do with it? But if we can rethink packaging to have intrinsic value in and of itself, and that people say, oh my God, I, I would spend money for this package because the package has other alternative use. That's the first step is to 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 rid ourselves of, of this concept. You know, you know, if you think of the human body, okay, is the brain very important? Well, yeah. Is the stomach very important? Well, yeah. Are the lungs very important? Is the liver? But when you go through that list, very rarely does anyone ever talk about the poor skin, okay? The skin is also a very, very important organ. It would be a puddle of goo if we didn't have our skin. Our skin is our packaging. And if we're going to be more like lifelike, like biology, we've got to recognize that the package and the product are one and the same in the future for us to be truly sustainable. Okay, and so that's yeah. that's kind of the way that I'm looking at it. But right now, it takes innovation, not, and that's why I mean it's not just chemists, product designers, right. people that want to invent the next product need to be working with the chemists, with the material scientists to invent materials that enable that kind of use and reuse. We're not always going to get it right. We're always going to have entropy rearing its ugly head, pushing us down to materials recycling and materials metabolism. But it's important to be focusing on finding a way to have that use and reuse be designed in as part of the inventive process. Yeah, and I feel like this relates to some of the, we, we got a few questions on um, ocean plastics. It's because it's one of those big issues that have, that have, mm -hmm. are, you know, that's in the news these days, um, you know, and so there's, there's been a, there was a few last week on this, um, talking about microplastics, the challenge of that, you know, how we're, how we're going to get beyond that. And there was, there was some also interesting questions about what to do with, you know, sort of, the the can we reuse plastic you know there i think i think what they're trying to get at is what are our options to sort of design our way out of this issue of um ocean plastics you know and what are the ranges of possible solutions and how can green chemistry really play a role there okay so you know just off the top of my head you know i'm going to you know, Parlay for the Oceans, an amazing organization pushing this. The Ocean Plastics Leadership Summit, amazing organization. The Alliance to End Plastic Waste, a great group of people. There's these organizations that are coming together to try to address this issue. And I think there's, you, they can look at the, the, the entire life cycle and try to find ways to induce and encourage behavioral modifications. Or we can look through green chemistry to invent new technologies that make that whole process easier. So when it comes to, to waste in the environment, 
plastics and other things. And so that there is getting that stuff out of the environment. That's an important task. There is preventing it from ever getting into the environment in the future. But then the third thing, and, and we, we talked about this last week, is we green chemists have to say, okay, there's going to be leakage. Stuff is going to get into the environment. How can we design it not to promote and suggest that people intentionally throw things out? Our economy needs things to stay within our commercial loops that we're trying to design. But if it does get out, how can we be confident that it's not going to hurt human health and the environment? If a tanker truck comes through the middle of a town and it tips over, instead of getting body bags, if we just got a broom, all right, that's where we need to be thinking is that accidents will happen, things will leak. And so the, for the future to truly be where we need it to be, it can't be just as long as people behave exactly the way they do and no accidents ever happen, this is gonna be great, but to design things so that it tolerates those unanticipated things, mm -hmm. that's true green chemistry. That's great. And, um, so shifting on to one another big global sustainability issue, I know we're coming up to the end of the hour, so I wanted to get to one of these questions and then um, close up with a little bit of focus more on your education points. Um, you know, I, I wanted to touch upon, because we got a few on climate change and, yeah. um, you know, because again, that's another big um, hot topic that's, uh, you know, how it's clearly top of mind for us. We've, we've got, we got a few questions, but what are some ways that green chemistry can um, address climate change? So again, climate change is, is built into the principles of green chemistry in several different ways. You know, the, the, you know, the, 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 bottom, the bottom line here is that when we look at energy utilization across all of the processes, if you think of lubrication, Okay, at a, at, in a factory, when you have gears turning, when you've got things happening, we're looking for bio-based lubricants and things like that, but we also need to increase the efficiency of the loss of energy from potential kinetic energy and entropy loss, that there are certain things that we still need to invent to minimize the waste of energy. When you think of any kind of a process in which you have to dry something, where you're evaporating either water or a solvent, when you're filtering, when you have vacuums, when you do all the things in industry that we plug in to do, we need to invent either the chemistry to not require those energy inputs or to design better systems that more efficiently do those transformations using less energy. And so I would argue that, you know, global climate change and green chemistry is kind of the, the top of the list. And, and it's just something that we oftentimes in green chemistry, because the, the focus oftentimes looks at toxicity, but arguably only two of the principles of green chemistry about toxicity. And so global environmental issues are tantamount to all of this is just the language and the discourse oftentimes focuses on that, that more problematic, scary stuff about toxicity. But green chemistry has to, you know, it's really, really simple. If you believe, if someone believes everything that needs to be invented has been invented, we just have to use it. In my opinion, you're wrong. Um, and we need still inventions. There's, 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 there's demonstration things that you may work at scale, may not work at scale. But at the end of the day, we need to invent the technologies to enable a, a, a reduction in CO2, not just by policies, not just by uh, encouragements by government policies and incentives and things like that. But we, if we're going to leapfrog this, it's going to be with technology as well as behavioral changes. And man, do we have a lot of work to do. So we're, we're at the end of the hour, but I'm, I wanted to um, yeah, uh, read a question that, that came in because I wanted to sort of close on this on the education um, point because I, I believe you you I believe you think that's quite important thank you for that um, but we did get a few on this on this uh, on education and um, you know there was questions about how do you teach creativity um, you know and then there was one 
you know, and I think that speaks to your, you know, point around invention too, um, as well. And what are what are some what are the short and long term objectives? This is the one that came in today, so thank you for this question. What are the short short term and long term objectives that a chemistry graduate can keep in mind for shaping a career in green chemistry and also contribute to the environment? Mm -hmm. So, couple couple important questions there. I'm going to start with creativity. I believe that babies are born with incredible creativity, imagination, and an innovative spirit. And unfortunately, right now, our academic structure robs them of that. They walk into school the first day believing they can do anything, and then they're taught that they can't. And so when I hear about how do we teach creativity, how do we teach innovation, my first response is, let's look at the academic system and find out where we're robbing them of it and stop robbing them of it. It's almost like having a university give a class on how to avoid student debt. You know, there's the a certain contradiction in that whole process. And so I feel that what we need to be doing is to be looking at what are the infrastructure things? What is the, the wedding on the precedent in, 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 in having this, this uh, over overemphasis of, of knowledge of the precedent as meaning some kind of, a, of an academic skill that the individual's beliefs and the individual's thoughts are just as valid. And we need to have some way of supporting it. Of course you need to understand precedent. Of course you need to understand the, what people have done in the past, but only as part of a tool of looking in the future. And so I, I think creativity and innovation is not something to be taught. It's something to not be removed from people because they are, everyone is already born with it. Now, when it comes to it, you've got a graduate student that's passionate, that says, I want to dedicate my life to doing the right thing, to focusing on this thing. My advice is, then do it. You don't look for a company that's going to let you do it. You refuse not to do it. You don't go to a university and say, oh, I want to get tenure, so I'll pretend I don't do this until I get tenure. Oh, my God, if you go to a university that you have to fake who you are to get tenure, you're at the wrong university. All right, that we need to embrace this thing and just refuse to not be who we want to be. And so this is not something that the, you know, of course, hopefully someday in the future, we have a universal environment that supports this perspective, but we don't have that today. And so we're going to need courage and strength of people to refuse not to do this. And, that, and so, so I, I wish I could have advice and say, oh, go work for this company because they want you to do this. Well, that, then, then we're robbing ourselves of our future. <laughs> you need to be, again, to, to use this, this horrible analogy of the times, you need to be the virus to infect companies so that they, without knowing it, become green and sustainable. And so please, by all means, don't just look for the comfortable path. The, the, the path with the most resistance is probably the most meaningful. <laughs> I love that. Um... I, 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 so I kind of want to close on that top, that point because I think that's that's very good. So the questions that we did not get to that came in today and from last week, we will post responses um, to those along with this recording. But John, just in closing, you know, um, what question have we not asked you, or is there are there you know key points that you would like to share is with the closing thoughts today? Well, I, I, I think at the end of the day, the most important thing is to recognize that everyone's thoughts, everyone's ideas, everyone's passions are valid and important. And to say, man, this is what I like to do. This is who I am. Find a way for that to be the path to the future that you want to give you know, and don't look at having that be absorbed or inherited from somebody else as much as being the driving force itself now there's a lot of resources out there to help you know I, shameless plug for Beyond Benign, the website Beyond Benign has amazing resources for K-12 educators, for university educators, the, the a developing industrial training um, um, aspect to Beyond Benign. So that is one of many other places. But and seek out to bring those resources to yourself. Don't look for the world to give you those resources. 
seek them out and insist on them. You know, it, it, it's, it, this can't be achieved passively. This has to be an aggressive insistence of not doing it any other way. And there's nobody on this webinar or in this field or in the world that doesn't have the ability to do amazing things. And so let's just do it. Completely agreed. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, John, for, for your time and your passion and all of your answers in, in, um, in this discussion. Thank you all for joining us. Um, just in closing, I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, we do have a webinar tomorrow. So um, particularly for our higher ed audience. Um, so please, please join us if you're able to tomorrow on this wonderful tool from Mill 4 Sigma, Dozen 2.0, and how we might incorporate that into our teaching and courses. Um, so that is, um, that's, uh, that's tomorrow. <laughs> and just, uh, again, a final thank you to all of you for tuning in last week and this week. Um, we can't thank you enough for joining in on this discussion with us. Um, a huge thank you to John for sharing again with us. And uh, please stay connected and uh, please stay involved. So thank you all. Thank you.